Welcome to this week's service of the Des Moines United Methodist Church. We're glad that you have chosen to be with us today and we welcome you. I want to remind you that there is a Facebook group, Feeding Body, Mind and Spirit, and we hope you will check it out. Welcome once again to our service. So hear these words as we gather for worship this morning. God has done mighty things in history because people have responded to God's call. We remember Abraham and the promise God made to him with the call to go to a new land. We step out in faith, not knowing where we go. God is faithful. We follow your lead, O Lord, even when we do not understand. God is faithful. Welcome to worship where God is praised and we are fed in body, mind, and spirit. Amen. What does this loaf of bread make you think of? The toast you had for breakfast? Yummy sandwiches? Or maybe that you're hungry? Can you think of any Bible stories that include bread? Bread is an important part of our church because bread is used as a symbol for Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus is like bread. That may sound funny at first, Jesus is like bread. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to explore some of the ways that Jesus is like bread and why this is an important symbol for us. Today we're gonna to hear a story about Jesus and some small loaves of bread Probably we would call them rolls or buns. There were once 5,000 tired and hungry and probably grumpy people sitting on a hillside waiting for dinner. They'd come to hear Jesus that day. They came before breakfast, stayed all morning, all afternoon, and way past dinner. No one had meant to be out there that long, but that's how it was, listening to Jesus, as if time didn't exist. People could listen to Jesus for hours, and on this particular day, that's just what they did. But they hadn't brought enough food, and they couldn't just go and buy themselves a burger and fries to go, because, of course, they were in the middle of nowhere with no shops or restaurants, and besides, that kind of food hadn't been invented yet. What would you do? What would they do? Jesus' friends had an idea. Let's send everyone home for dinner. They don't need to go, Jesus said. You can give them something to eat. Did Jesus want them to travel all the way to town and buy food for everyone? Jesus' friends panicked. But we don't have enough money. What food do you have? Jesus asked. Go and see. Now there was a little boy in the crowd. He had brought a lunch that his mother had made for him that morning. He looked at his five loaves and two fish. It wasn't much, not nearly enough for 5,000, but it was all he had. I have some, he said. Jesus' friends laughed when they saw his little lunch. That's not nearly enough, they said, but they were wrong. Jesus knew it didn't matter how much the little boy had. God would make it enough, more than enough. Jesus said, bring me what you have. And so the little boy gave Jesus his lunch. Jesus winked at the little boy and whispered in his ear, watch. How in the world will Jesus feed everyone with just that, Jesus' friends said, because they thought it was impossible. But Jesus knew the one who made all the fish in the oceans and Jesus knew the one who in the very beginning had made everything out of nothing at all. How hard would something like this be for someone like that? Jesus took the little boy's lunch, looked up to heaven, and thanked his father. Then Jesus gave the little lunch back to his friends. And Jesus' friends started to hand out the food. Do you know what? It was the strangest thing. No matter how much they broke off, 
There was always more and more and more, enough for 5,000. Everyone ate as much as they wanted, second helpings, third helpings, even fourths, until they were full, and still there were leftovers. Well, Jesus did many miracles like this, things people thought couldn't happen that weren't natural, but it was the most natural thing in all the world. It's what God has been doing from the beginning, of course, taking the nothing and making it everything, taking the emptiness and filling it up, taking the darkness and making it light. It was a child who helped Jesus in this miracle by offering to share his bread. Jesus needs us to be part of miracles in our world too, by sharing what we have, by sharing our love with others. Every time we see bread, it can remind us of Jesus. God shared Jesus with us so we could be filled with love. Amen. Have a great week. It is difficult, especially I remember the first time I went abroad and it's it's new and it's um, not familiar. And so along with that, there is a level of fear. And right. so you, you talked about that. Actually, you were giving a commencement speech to a group of college students several years ago and you spoke quite candidly about how much fear there is in our society today. And you mm -hmm. told those students that fear can stifle one's ability to be compassionate. Uh, yeah. In fact, you repeated it more than once. You said to those students, don't be afraid. And right. you know, you sounded a little like those angels instructing the shepherds on Christmas, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know, I've been thinking about that lately, Tammy, in a more, even a more spiritual sense. You know, now, first of all, I would never encourage anybody to take any risks. I don't take risks when I'm traveling, but you, you, you need to recognize that. Um, well, first of all, when I grew up, people said bon voyage. They didn't say have a safe trip. And uh, statistically, it is safer to to leave home than it is to stay home if if you really are are going to you know um uh, split hairs and wonder what is safe um so uh, there's nothing dangerous about traveling but i long for the days when people would say bon voyage again instead of having have a safe trip if somebody tells me I have a safe trip i'm inclined to say well you have a safe a safe stay at home because where i'm going <laughs> is safer than where you're staying but you know i think one thing might be have a safe trip you know, we risk upsetting our norms when we travel. And maybe part of the danger of traveling is we recognize that we recognize our ethnocentricity. We, we recognize our, 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 uh, how we're struggling, how we're needy. And when we travel, we recognize there's more to life than increasing its speed. When we travel, we realize that suffering across the sea is just as real as suffering across the street. When we travel, we realize why Thomas Jefferson wrote, travel makes a person wiser if less happy. When we travel, we realize that we've been duped. I'll never forget the first time I went down to Central America, a long time ago, I went on a political trip. I went down there to learn about economic justice in Central America. And my dad, on the, on the, at the airport, my dad, the last thing he said was, son, don't be duped. Now, what, what did he mean? Don't be duped. He didn't want me to drink the Kool-Aid of those um, economic justice causes, that liberation theology uh, uh, action. And he didn't want me to recognize the truth down there. And he was thinking I would be duped if I did. It's scary to get out of your norm and to realize maybe we're not the center. Maybe this is not, maybe, maybe Jesus is not a white guy who speaks English, you know, my Lord, <laughs> I, I love that. And that takes a little courage sometimes.
I will be reading from Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed for, from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his son, brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem to the oak of Morah, at the time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed by, on by stages toward the Negev. This morning, I have asked Terry to help me with a little dialogue. So I imagine this is between Abraham and God. Abraham, this is God speaking. I want you to leave everything and go to the land I will show you. Where's that? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Try me. 1,500 miles from here in a place called Canaan. Never heard of it. I know. And guess what? What? I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. That's impossible. I don't have any children. Don't worry. What do you mean, don't worry? Just trust me. Let me see if I've got this straight. You want me to leave everything, travel across the desert to some place I've never heard of, and become the father of a great nation? Right. Is this some kind of a joke? No. What am I supposed to tell my wife? Now that is your problem. Uh. Abraham is one of my favorite people. I love Old Testament stories because it helps us understand how God continues to call us today and the people of faith that God trusted. God trusted these people. So he chose a man named, at the beginning, named Abram. And in the story of Abraham, his, his name gets changed, but the scripture we read this morning talks about him as Abram. So why does God call out just one guy? Why does God do that? So this morning I want you to do a little experiment with me. I want you to think about God for a moment. If you have to, close your eyes, imagine what God is like, and what comes to mind. I imagine that there are hundreds of ideas and images that are generated as I ask that question. And I'm sure that if we could flash all those across the screen, each one may be radically different from another one. But one thing they all have in common, they are all wrong. Not totally wrong. That's not what I'm saying about our understanding of God, but wrong in the sense that none of us could ever possibly picture God. As St. Augustine said, if you can explain it, then it's not God. And maybe that's why God chose Abraham, because he wanted us to learn how to be the people of God. Notice what God says to Abram in the scripture, I will bless you so that the nations of the world will be blessed through you. So God is saying he chose one guy, not because he loved Abraham more, not because everyone wants us to be like Abraham. He chose one guy not to create a private members club only. He chose one person so that we, 
because we can't get our minds around what God would be like. I give you this blessing so that you may bless those around, is what God is saying to Abraham. That's a huge thing for Abraham to do. It's a huge job for Abraham to do. And in the fourth verse of our lesson today, we read these words. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. I wonder a lot about Abraham. In our scripture, he kind of des describes Abraham as this kind of laid back, calm, cool, collected guy. And he seems to be taking everything in stride, trusting God. And he is one of the last people in the Old Testament that actually has the image of walking next to God as he travels through his days. But there are times that I wonder if Abraham had a struggle of what it meant to follow in God's, follow God's journey. Did he regret at times saying yes to God? I wonder how many times Abraham regretted uprooting his family to take them to who knows where. Even as our skit said, I don't even know where Canaan is. I wonder how many times he wondered if God would ever make good on the promises of land and children. Abraham's journey certainly was not an easy one, and we know from the story that there were times when Abraham did not trust God fully. If you continue to read Abraham's story from through the rest of the book of Genesis, you will discover that there are a couple of times when he didn't trust God to take care of them, where he told the Pharaoh that Sarah wasn't his wife but was his sister because he was afraid if the Pharaoh wanted to marry her, because she was so beautiful that the Pharaoh would kill Abraham so he could have Sarah as his wife. There are times when Abraham isn't as faithful as we would like to believe him to be. The journey was not easy. And it must have been difficult to hold on to God's promise. Another year passes, no child. God, Abraham continues to journey with God no child, no land. And finally, when Isaac is born, we have the story that follows that Abraham is then asked to take Isaac to a mountain and to be sacrificed only to be blessed again by God at trusting God that a ram shows up. Abraham's yes to God's calling was a moment of blessing, not just for Abraham, but for his family and for us. And it led to many, many years of uncertainty and struggle. But each time Abraham followed God, God was calling their names as a blessing to the world. And that's very similar to us. When we are baptized, we are claiming that we are part of God's beloved children, part of God's greater family. As adults, we continue to participate in the life of a congregation or a community of faith because we want to be here. Whether you can put those words or that feeling inside or share it with anyone, we are drawn to being a part of a community of faith because we are drawn to the story of Abraham and the calling that God has for our life. It's my hope that whatever community of faith that you are part of, that you find support and nourishment. But the truth is, journeying together in any community of faith is not easy. There are times when we are careless with our words and our actions. There are times when we let each other down. There are times when we wrestle with wondering, is God really calling us to this mission? Are we faithfully following God in this journey? There are times when we think, what am I doing here? There are moments when we wonder, is being a part of this community of faith worth the effort that it's asking me? There are times, and I've heard this in churches all around, that they are people that want to find another community of faith, one that doesn't have any conflicts or only nice people or no complaints, and I want to say to you, if you find that church, then you call me, because I haven't been in a community of faith yet who hasn't figured out how they have to work together, who hasn't figured out how there are times we're not easy to live with. There are times when we are called to journey with God, even 
despite the obstacles that we face. God calls us and keeps calling us to follow, to worship, to serve, to love. Abraham was blessed so that Abraham could bless the world, that all of us are part of that great family. God chose Abraham to show God's faithfulness, not necessarily Abraham's faithfulness to God, but God was always faithful to Abraham. And that's one of the lessons that we need to learn today. Every time Abraham messed up or we mess up, God remains faithful. God remains with us. And all through it, Abraham continued to put one foot in front of the other, step by step, trusting God would take him where he needed to go. In Abraham, we see a faith that trusted God even in the moment of doubt, even in the time of fear, even in uncertainty. You see, Abraham's story for us is a promise of God's love for each one of us. God chooses us not because we're perfect or deserve it, simply because God's nature is love. This is what God calls us to trust, to trust that we are loved and that we are blessed. As we journey in faith, our road will not be smooth with one another or even our own personal walk with God will have times of difficulty. And in those conversations, we tackle that knowing that God is with us, knowing that God continues to guide us. I find this so many times in my life that it's an absolutely incredible story. Abraham follows, not knowing where God wanted him to go. And because God calls him into the unknown, we are part of that great family. Abraham's wife couldn't have children, but they had a son. So Abraham was called by God to believe in the impossible. And that is still how God works today. Hear that again. Abraham was called to believe in the impossible. And that is how God works today. This morning I want to close with a prayer. And it's a prayer that reminds me of Abraham and Sarah and that God chooses us with all the perfections that we have. So join with me in prayer. Gracious God, you gave us our voices, no two the same. You did as with Abraham and Sarah. You take and touch our lives so they can become extraordinary. And in your church, you have gathered us in your community of common folk, complainers and prophets and puzzled people and smiling and joyful people. You call us and make a place for us. So what we say and do here, what we ponder and decide here, will be real for us and honest to you as you prepare us for a life of the world in which you are praised and we are a blessing to someone else. Amen. This morning, let us take our hearts and our minds to a moment of prayer. Gracious God, you have blessed us in so many ways. With the story of Abraham, you have called us to carry on that trust and that covenant and to be a blessing to someone else. So this morning, we lift our prayers to you that you may 
we may be a blessing to someone who is hungry this week. We may be a blessing to someone who is hurting this week. We may be a blessing to someone who needs just that hello and smile. We may be a blessing to someone whose family is struggling with COVID or whose children are frightened, and we can assure them that, God, you are with us. And so in this time of prayer, we lift to you those prayers deepest in our hearts. And as your sons and daughters, hear us as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May you find sanctuary among trees and stones and feel earth preparing a place for you to sit and breathe and be. Let the long limbs of branches form a canopy above your head. Let the hills open up a place for you to soar. May the stones form an altar and see how the sun makes everything shimmer and glisten so that everything shines forth from within. Let the tender vine climbing the trunk show you what it is to reach to the sky. Let all the living creatures that gather, winged and four-footed ones, offer a new companionship. See yourself as part of this glorious cathedral. The lake and holy wells are the fonts of baptism. The river rushes carrying gifts down from the mountains. The oaks and sycamore create a sacred circle. The face of the creator incarnate and imminent illuminated with each gaze. Feel the veil between heaven and earth slip away until you know the sanctuary of soil and sunlight. Listen to the sky whisper her secrets on the wind, lifted by wings and song. 